Signal Sciences secures the most important web applications, APIs, and microservices of the world's leading companies, protecting over 7,500 applications and 150 billion production requests per week. Signal Sciences Next Gen WAF and RASP help companies increase security and maintain site reliability without sacrificing velocity, all at the lowest total cost of ownership. Signal Sciences patented technology protects any application against any attack with integrations into any DevOps toolchain. Signal Sciences, demand more from your WAF. Learn more at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Let the team at Black Hills Information Security test your defenses. With over 10 years of experience in penetration testing, red teaming, and threat hunting, the testers at Black Hills will help you find the holes in your security before the bad guys do. The team at Black Hills cares about educating and sharing their knowledge by creating countless blogs, open source tools, and webcasts for you to learn more about the tradecraft of pen testing and red teaming. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash BHIS to join their mailing list and view the latest blogs and webcasts from Black Hills Information Security. The greatest threat to businesses today isn't the outsider trying to get in. It's the people you trust, the ones who already have the keys, your employees, contractors, and privileged users. 60% of online attacks are carried out by insiders. To stop these insider threats, you need to see what users are doing before an incident occurs. Observe it enables security teams to detect risky user activity, investigate incidents in minutes, and effectively respond. Get your free trial at observeit.com forward slash security weekly. Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. EC Council is now offering our listeners a free pass to attend the two-day conference at Hacker Halted. Use the discount code HH19SW or go to securityweekly.com forward slash Hacker Halted. Our guest for this segment is Paul Claxton, who has a history of containing, uh, uh, compromising almost 25 years of professional successes Honorably discharged uh, from the U.S. Marine Corps, uh, accomplished visionary and technology leader. Paul, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. It's nice to have you here with us. Uh, Paul, why don't you start by giving us a, a little more about your background other than what I can read off a teleprompter. <laughs> Anti-air uh, threat operation, infantry operations to uh, running command centers uh, where we monitor different threats across an, uh, a wide area of operations about 5,200 square miles of operations with uh, over affecting over six to 7,000 different uh, personnel, military and civilian contractors and managing those reports and, and uh, uh, threat detections um, with uh, a command operation where I ran a command operation center. And, uh, we report it directly to the Pentagon. Um, after leaving the Marine Corps in 2010, I've spent the last uh, nine or uh, nine years or so within the technology space, um, most recently getting more into um, cybersecurity uh, protection, um, detection, and helping organizations out with compliance, uh, both on the federal and in the uh, public sector side, or uh, public sector and private sector side. Sorry. Awesome. Hey, Paul, just uh, watch out for your microphone Mike. hitting your shirt. Yeah, it's like popping. When oh, you move okay. around, yeah, you may want to hold it with maybe hold it with one hand away from your shirt. Yeah, when you talk. Sure. There you go. Awesome. Um, so it it says here um, we want to talk about the uh, social engineering and phishing aspect. And when I talk to all my friends that do pen testing, it's still the number one way in which both attackers, you know, and red teamers and pen testers are getting in. The there are some more elite organizations where. It's a lot more difficult, um, but I feel like those are like maybe the five percent where it's really hard, and the rest like really tried and true phishing techniques and social engineering still works. What can we do to improve the resiliency uh, of our enterprise businesses to uh, be more effective at combating you know social engineering and phishing attacks? So I I think it has a lot to do with uh, getting to the the root cause, uh, so taking more of a foundational approach. In the past, in the past, the approach that many organizations have taken to um, assessing their, their uh, uh, cybersecurity threats, um, existing, existing threats out throughout there was more of a technological approach or engineering approach. Um, now, what we're seeing is kind of a shift into more of the social engineering aspect of it. Um, and we're seeing more organizations take more of an offensive approach uh, 
towards prevention um, of these kinds of attacks versus a defensive approach um, and looking outside um, of what existing threats uh, uh, may, uh, may be out there. And then looking inside and taking a preventative approach uh, in, in that aspect. Um, and so by looking inside an in organization, we can start to dis uh, discern where uh, single threat points may exist. Uh, we can start to look for patterns and we can start to um, you know, create uh, synthetic landscapes almost, um, so to speak, uh, and kind of profile um, hack hackers um, to uh, based on the end industry or the particular uh, role uh, of an organization or of a department and we can kind of build out profiles from there um, as far as where a likely threat might come from um, based on on, on the, on the uh, uh, profile of the organization the, the industry and the potential um, profile of uh, known hackers that uh, have had a history of, of conducting attacks on, on these types of organizations so go ahead Matt. i was going to say do we does the proliferation of social media for example um have an impact uh into the, some of the social engineering if we think about you know all of our profiles as is executives right because as we start to talk about um uh, coo cmos even ceos right um We've got these profiles out on social media that are public. They're all over the place. And, yeah. you know, how do you educate executives on what you do and don't do in social media to help prevent some of these uh, attacks against the, those social media profiles to be used against you as part of campaigns to get or to your environment? Or not just against you, but against your staff or, or the company, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, you could fish the assistants, but you still might want to know something about their C-level executive that they're working with, right? Right. To complete the fish, basically. Right. In the, in and this. you have all this information available publicly mm -hmm. that can now be used against you mm -hmm. as part of these social engineering attacks. And I think if we take phishing out of it for a second, because, you know, phishing is still a big problem, don't get me wrong, and, and a lot of people click on the link, and, and but social media plays this whole new role uh, in social engineering and, and the ability to get intelligence about organizations and, and your executives, I mean, how do you how do you educate them to defend against some of this stuff? Uh, there's a lot of factors that weigh in here. Um, what I've seen uh, in working with startup companies, uh, there does seem to be um, an existing gap uh, between um, uh, the the leadership. Uh, at the, at the top and the leadership in the middle tiers of the organization. Um, so I think there's a there's an education piece here um, with uh, leaders who may come from one side of an industry, and uh, there there's definitely um, I would say an education piece on, in terms of like the mindset of a hacker um, and you know the what they might be looking for. Uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, breaking through, uh, you know, uh, social, you know, breaking through uh, in, into an organization through uh, social media or social engineering. Yeah, and so do we see this playing out as, as better policies and education and kind of that awareness discussion again to really start to educate and, and maybe put some policies in place? So like, look, yeah, if, you're, if the, you're an executive, <laughs> these are some things we have to just really think about. Um, in your profiles yeah the cio and the site uh, CISOs should really be involved in all different aspects uh and, and different levels of the organization and ultimately they should be working directly with um you know the human resources offices and the chief marketing uh officers to control how that information is flown uh in and out of their organization so it, it's it really is a leadership um uh, it really is a leadership uh, task of the of the CISOs and the CIOs to um, kind of lead the front, uh, so to speak, when it comes to the information flow um, in and out of the organization and to lead those HR departments and those marketing departments for how that information is disseminated, 
disseminate it, and then you know what uh, their employees has access to, uh, what their what kind of information their vendors have access to, and so forth. Well, you know, I I think it's really, we say trust, but verify. I think it's distrust and verify. (laughs) It's really, in some respects, it's really the strategy to uh, help protect your organization. And if you use that as the foundation for your security culture, I think you're in in much better shape. Now, we here at Security Weekly greatly benefit from that being organically built in the organization because everyone that works here gets exposure to all of us, all of the Security Weekly family who are all largely security professionals, actually are security professionals, uh, and they you know organically hear everything we're saying on the shows. And so inherently that distrust uh, of whatever's coming in from whatever channel uh, is, yeah. is certainly present. As an organization grows, that gets harder and harder Paul, do you have tips for organizations how they can kind of build that security culture? So I, I think, so I come from the military and in the military, security is, it's a big uh, consideration to everything that we do. Uh, you know, everything that we do uh, from, it, it's it's ingrained and in, in eaten into our minds and everything that we do, even if it means locking the door. Right. Um, even if it means, uh, you know, locking, you know, um, locking the, the padlock uh, on, a, on a wall locker or on a, on a foot locker. So, and, and those are just basic uh, small habits that you can build up over time uh, to instill uh, a, a, a security as a mindset, so to speak. I'll say SAS, security as a standard. Uh, into your employees and honestly it should be built into everyone's job description from the top of the organization all the way down to the bottom uh, levels of the organization whether it's the the janitor or the the, the front desk secretary everybody needs to have job have uh, security built into their job description and and really the way that the organization thinks because um, what, what I have found is that organizations tend to get siloed um, within their own roles. And so you have a lot of disconnect points um, where hackers can ploy, ploy or play on the emotions of those employees. And so we really need to be socially con- uh, conscious of what what is going on uh, you know, outside of the organization and what is happening to other organizations within the industry, um, and that needs to be ed- um, that needs to be educated uh, to all the employees within the organization in terms of uh, you know how do we if, if we give our employees um, handheld devices, uh, phones, iPads, um, what are the procedures and protocols for uh, you know for for uh, managing and, and maintaining the device. Right? Um, so having having those standards in place, I think, is, is really key. Um, what are our employees doing when they're not at work? Um, employee, uh, employee and contractor security is obviously an issue and what employees have access to. It can become an HR issue. It, it can also become a marketing issue. If uh, any IP gets leaked, uh, you can certainly lose um, you know, you can certainly uh, compromise yourself from a IP standpoint, uh, from a product standpoint uh, within the market. And, you know, all of this has rippling effects, whether it's, you know, litigation or, uh, you know, or whether you lose customer or you don't get a customer um, because you lost credibility in the market. And so it all starts at the, the, the lowest levels of the organization. It's not just... I mean, we see a lot of news stories, um, you know, with executives, uh, you know, responsible for for this cybersecurity breach or, or whatever it may be. But uh, I, I would say it's, it's not just the executives uh, at the top. It's not just their their fault. It's it's the entire organization uh, that essentially, you know, that essentially failed there. So uh, yeah, uh, it really is. It really is up to the. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Well, Sorry. you know, what I found interesting about what you're saying, Paul, was that um, you talk about intellectual property, right? And I think it extends even beyond that to all of the uh, 
uh, property and information that the company controls mm -hmm. and yeah. arming employees knowing what uh, how to handle that information right yeah, so sure. yes sure your most senior engineers right you've likely had conversations or they just inherently know that what they're working on is really sensitive so i'm not going to share that with other people but that trickles down all the way through the everyone in the organization has to know their role and how they handle information yeah and the best social engineers in the world the best pen testers in the world have told me that they they've run into trouble trying to get into an organization when any single one of those employees just has that inherent distrust mm -hmm. and is just yeah. questioning them questioning them and basically not giving them information or access to a computer or the building because they're not able to verify them and we had chris had Nagy come on uh paul security weekly talking about a time where he was uh, essentially uh you know almost i don't know if we talked about it being completely shut down or almost shut down mm -hmm. But pretty darn close shutdown. We've yeah. had uh, smart folks from Trusted Sec talk about and Black Hills talk about when they get tripped up, it's because there's an employee, doesn't matter if they're the CEO and founder or the security you know, guard or the security yeah. guard, doesn't matter. One of their employees has tripped them up in a strategic move that they were trying to make to gain access because of that inherent distrust. And I think it's that building well, of culture to not just understand, you know, you know, everyone should know where the intellectual property is, but you should also know the other information and levels of access that could lead people to that and safeguard that as uh, a representative of your organization. Well, so, social media is actually our biggest threat. I mean, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not a hacker. <clears throat> I, I, I don't. I don't have, that's, that's not my job. What I do is I work with organizations to help them from a strategic standpoint to understand the importance of uh, cybersecurity. My, my team of engineers, they do the hacking, the ethical hacking, right? The pen testing, that kind of stuff. But I'll go back to the CISO and the CIO. It really, it's, it's their job, the CISO, to set up a, uh, a set of protocols and, and security procedures to abide by, it's a system's job to essentially say no, right? The CIO, it is his job to manage that information and that flow throughout the organization and to direct different departments. They should have a pulse on every employee in every department within that organization. And they should essentially be the almost kind of linchpin between just those, those uh, other departments and, and employees within the organization in between the CEO and the CEO. So I could go on to any social media platform and build myself a hacker profile. And I could easily, I, I could attack, I could attack pretty much any organization that I can think of just by using psychological warfare yeah. and, or, or, you know, uh, psychological uh, warfare tactics or military tactics, um, you know, uh, art of, if you've ever read Sun Tzu's Art of War, um, I could use any of those and break through uh, an organization's security posture. It's not hard. And that's where the real threat exists because it's, it used to be really difficult to, um, you know, hack a system or, or to break through a company's uh, cybersecurity framework. That is not the case anymore. Technology has enabled uh, a threat landscape like no other, but not just uh, uh, technology at a broad level, but we're talking about emerging trends. Yeah. And, and so that's where you also get into one of the previous questions that you had asked, you know, how do we get, how do we tap into uh, leaders within an organization? Well, if you're dealing with, you know, a large company that's been around for 50 or 60 years, you know, those executives within that organization have been, they've, they've gotten essentially uh, many times complacent, you know, and it can't happen to me, right? That's a mindset of complacency. It can't happen to me. And it's not that they don't necessarily have the knowledge or the network or the connections, it's just that they've gotten comfortable. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of the coin, you have the emerging trends and companies and technologies out here, these startups that are seemingly becoming billion dollar companies overnight. And you have these founders that essentially have maybe you know worked in one or two areas or done one or two things their entire life. And so they have a almost a limited business or 
limited uh, uh, work capacity, right, or limited experience. And because of that limited experience, they don't necessarily always know what to look for. I, I saw an article the other day that I said you should hire a CIO if they if they've been at a company that had a breach hmm. because they they've been through that war, so to speak. And so it really is about. And, and I again, I, I'm not being biased here, but uh, military minds are really good at you know uh, understanding hackers I, because it's it's understanding your enemy so profiling your enemy out uh, you know what is what is their mission what's what type of what is the landscape you know what what are the avenues of approach where where could a threat likely come from and so really being situationally aware from a 360 degree kind of balanced uh you know perspective or, or approach and really taking countermeasures, but also proactive measures to thwart you know, any potential threat. Um, yeah, they, I mean, they, I, I, agree that, I agree that that's a part of it. I think having intelligence on the attackers is part of it. Yeah. And I think across the board, everyone in the organization should yeah. and should continue that training. I think Chris Adnaki talked about that security yeah, guard story, right. that his yeah. recommendation was let that security guard, who was awesome, train other people in the organization, right? And I think that the training is largely misunderstood. I think we're still yeah. in that mindset of, well, maybe let's understand the techniques and learn when to say yes or no. Yeah. I don't think that's it at all. Yeah. I think it's how do you verify and make the decision as to whether to say yes or no where the training should be. I think we try and make it too sure. like black, like, oh, I think that looks like a threat, so I'm going to say no. What we should be teaching people is how to verify that. How do I verify that the social media profile that then the persona they created is fake or not? How do I verify a wire transfer? How do I verify if someone needs this type of information and there's a different verification step for yeah. the different levels of sensitivity of data uh, in your organization? So one of the articles I read this week that we didn't cover on BSW mm -hmm was an article, and we might cover it next week, about how the CIO and maybe even the CISO should report to HR. And in the article claims, right, it's an Seen interesting concept, yeah. right, where because of the people aspects in your organization and because of social media, that you almost want IT and security reporting into HR so that it becomes part of your HR culture as a way to potentially... Uh, educate and create this awareness from an HR program perspective. Don't think about these awareness programs mm -hmm. is something that happens on the side from the security teams or from the from the the IT teams. They actually become part of your overall HR yeah. uh, policies. And it, it was an interesting article because I haven't thought about it from that perspective. But when you talk about social engineering and social media and some of these uh, aspects, by embedding that into your HR programs. Will that actually help facilitate this learning across mm -hmm. a diverse employee base, most of which don't come from the military, don't come from security, like we all here on this uh, interview are, but to, to try to educate the, the layman mm -hmm. on what does it mean um, to have this data out there and, and how do you approach and verify different types of activities and, mm -hmm. and do a little more due diligence. I just thought it was a really interesting approach that I hadn't thought about before. And I, Paul, I don't know if you've seen anybody trying to integrate the HR teams in doing this and, and are they more effective if they've done that? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I, I've got experience working with HR. I, I've spent some time in the staffing industry. Um, I don't know if I would have the seat my opinion, I don't know if I would have the CIO or the CISO reporting to HR, but more so working within the legal confines in employee uh, laws um, or in employee management laws uh, in, in terms of like how, how can you uh, essentially uh, monitor employees? Where does that monitoring stop? I mean, if you give them advice, a phone or an iPad, and you take it home. Where at what point does that monitoring stop? Yeah. Right, and and now you've got now you've got other uh, technologies that are starting to come out and into you know the, the uh, private 
yeah. sector here. And, and I think uh, it's more, as, and Paul, I think it's more than just having the device. It's what happens when I go home and I go on my home PC and I get onto Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn and sure. all this information's out there. I'm still an attack vector um, as an employee, even though I don't, I don't necessarily have an employee uh, provided device because I'm doing it from my home PC. And so that takes monitoring to a completely different level if we think about it now, because now I can't monitor that iPhone or that iPad. How do I monitor the home PC? And you run into all kinds of privacy issues with this. We've yeah. seen some technologies evolve that do a, a, a good job, like Zero Fox, for example, yeah. and monitoring social media activity and looking for some of those anomalies. Um, I don't know that that is mainstream technology that a lot of organizations are using yet, but that'd be one way to say, I can monitor stuff, whether it's on employee devices or home devices, because now I have an ability to monitor social media, which is an, a, a potential attack vector. So, Well, you know, I think, I think sof sophistication is simplicity, right? Uh, there's a lot of ways to over, over complicate something, but at the end of the day, um, you know, leadership is not making leadership decisions or is not always the most, you know, it's not always in favor of everybody's appeasement, so to speak. And, uh, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, we need to protect our employees. We need to protect our assets within an organization and we need to have a standard for why we do that or, yeah. or a purpose for why we do that and a standard on how we do that. And at the end of the day, a leader needs to essentially put their foot down. We also need to look at what kind of leaders we have uh, within uh, you know, executive roles at you know, these organizations who are making these decisions. Yeah. Uh, we've had some breaches where there's there's been insider trading going on. Uh, the executive knew about the breach and he failed to say anything he cashed out his shares because he knew that if he publicized the breach well i'm gonna lose all this money right? so that's uh, well that's so, where that's where the sec and and some of these other agencies get to get into um come into play because uh, look yeah. they did it but they weren't going to get away with it in, in a public trading environment. So, I mean, that's good, but it's, it's harder to maybe deal with some of that on a, on a smaller scale or somebody that's not public. So I, I I'm, sure. I'm with you though. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, it does, it does come down to, uh, in, in information who, who, what, and, and when are they accessing, uh, the information and, and, you know, you take a broad approach and then from there, you know, what, what kind of pattern, uh, detections, you know, do, do we see happening here? Uh, you know, if there, if, if there's a threat against us, you know, well, what has been the, uh, the, the line of history, so to speak, have they attacked other organizations within our same industry? If so, how do they do it? So, also, you know, studying past lessons or lessons learned, I think, is is a, a key to preventing future attacks. But also, you know, as we begin to embrace newer technologies, um, ensuring that we have security is a key element to that. And a lot of organizations are not, you know, taking, a, you know, they, they, there's so many threats out there. So it's almost kind of overwhelming. Um, to uh, to adopt a, um, I guess you could say, like an ever prevalent and, um, you know, just a continually scaling and uh, adapting um, approach to cybersecurity. And by, I think, really employing that, that social engineering and, uh, uh, approach to things, we can begin to look at cybersecurity more as uh, less of a cost and more as a way of doing things. Agreed. Uh, I don't have any more questions. I don't either. either. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Thank you so much, Paul. Yeah. And with that, we'll take a Thank short you. break and uh, come back with our next guest, Matt Wickhouse from Finite State. Stay tuned. <laughs> 